Live from the BDN Studios, it's Bang and Dang. That's awesome. If you don't like that, then you ain't black. Welcome back to According to Wikipedia with your hosts, Bang and Dang, the show where we read random Wikipedia articles. Uh, ranging from climate change, sexual intercourse, Napoleonic Wars, or in today's case, the Dodo Bird. The Dodo. And I never in my life would have thought that the Dodo Bird would have so much written about it. <laughs> this guy is more popular than uh, uh, Mafia guys. I don't even understand it. Ridiculous. What the hell's going on with this guy? The Dodo is an extinct flightless bird that was endemic to the island of Mauritius, which is east of Madagascar in the Indian Ocean. The Dodo's closest genetic relative was the also extinct Rodriguez Solitaire. Oh. Who... Kind of looked like a turkey. It's a, Yeah, it's a turkey with a uh, long neck, longer neck. It's like a swan turkey. Or a schwerky. <laughs> um, the two formed the subfamily Raffinae, which was a clade of extinct flightless birds that were part of the family, which includes pigeons and doves. Yeah, they do have a dove. They did have a dove head, didn't it? Um, the closest living relative of the dodo is the Nicobar pigeon, which is a little, uh, it's a little purdy little bird. The dodo was variously declared a small ostrich, a rail, an albatross, or a vulture by early scientists. 1842, Danish zoologist jo- Johannes Theodor Reinhardt proposed that dodos were ground pigeons based on studies of a dodo skull he had discovered in the collection of the Natural Hist- History Museum of Denmark. Hmm. Okay. All right. So a pigeon, huh? A pigeon and an ostrich. This view was met with ridicule, but later supported by English naturalist uh, Hugh Edwin Strickland and also Alexander Gordon Melville in their 1848 monograph, The Dodo and Its Kindred, which attempted to separate myth from reality. After dissecting the preserved head and foot of the specimen at the Oxford University Museum, they compared it with few remains then available at the, of the extinct Rodriguez Solitaire. They concluded that the two were closely related. Strickland stated that although not identical, these boids shared many, many, many distinguishing features of the leg bones, otherwise known only in pigeons. Okay. Strickland and Melville established that the dodo was anatomically similar to pigeons in many features. They pointed to the very short keratinous portion of the beak with its long, slender, nask, oh, nask, naked basal part. Uh, Other pigeons also have bare skin around their eyes, almost reaching their beak as uh, do dodos. Forehead was high in relation to the beak, and the nostril was located low on the middle of the beak and uh, surrounded by skin. A combination of features shared only with penguins or penguins, <laughs> <laughs> pigeons. The legs of the dodo were generally more similar to those of terrestrial pigeons than of other birds, both in their scales and in their skeletal features. That's fantastic! Look at that. Depictions of the large crop hinted at a relationship with pigeons, in which the, this feature is more developed than other birds. Pigeons generally have very small clutches. I don't know what any of these words are. What is a clutch? It's a feet? Clutch of eggs. Oh, okay. okay. Why they can't, why, well, then say that. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is rigmarole. <laughs> yeah. Pigeons generally have a very small clutches, as in eggs. And the dodo is said to have laid a single egg, though. Ooh, really? Like pigeons, the dodo lacked the vomer and septum of the nostrils. And it shared details in the mandible. Uh, the zygomatic bone, the palate, and the hallux. The dodo differed from other pigeons mainly in the small size of wings and the large size of the beak and a proportion of the rest of the cranium. Right, it's like yeah. a toucan. It kind of looks like a a vulture, though. It's a vulture. It's a vulture shaped like, oh, it's pointy, but it's a toucan long beak. Right. It's like a mixture of everything. Right. And it's got, like, turkey legs. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Throughout the 19th century, several species were classified as congeneric with the dodo, including the Rodriguez Solitaire and the Reunion, Reunion Solitaire, as Didus Solitarius and Raphis Solitarius, respectively. The Didus and Raphis being names for the dodo genus used by different authors of the time. An atypical 17th century description of a dodo and bones found on Rodriguez, now known to have belonged to the Solitaire, led Abraham D. Bartlett to name a new species, the Didus Nazarenus, in 1852. Fantastic. Based on solitary remains, it is now a synonym of that species. So, same thing. Crude drawings of the red rail of uh, Mauritius right, mm. uh, were also misinterpreted as dodo species Didus Brocli and Didus Herberti. <laughs> Don't start with these stupid uh, Latin names, man. For many years, the dodo and the Rodriguez solitaire were placed in a family of the very own, the Raphidae. Formerly the Diddy Day. (laughs) 
not can be fused with uh, National P Diddy Day. <laughs> <laughs> It's because, Diddy Day. <laughs> because their exact relationships with other pigeons were unresolved. Each was also placed in its own monotypic family, as it was thought that they had evolved their similarities independently. Well, okay. Osteological and DNA analysts has said had since led to the dissolution of the family Raffidae, and the dodo and solitaire are now placed in their own subfamily, the Raffinae, within the family of Columbidae. <laughs> Okay. 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 <laughs> okay. okay day. Uh, 2002 American geneticist Beth Shapiro and colleagues analyzed the DNA of the dodo for the first time. Comparison of mitochondrial cytochrome B and 12S RRNA sequences isolated from a tarsal of the Oxford specimen and a femur of a Rodriguez solitaire confirmed their close relationship and their placement within the Columba Day. The uh, genetic evidence was interpreted as showing the Southeast Asian Nicobar pigeon to be their closest living relative, which you said, followed by the crowned pigeons of New Guinea and the superficially dodo-like tooth-billed pigeon, pigeon from Samoa. This clade consists of generally ground-dwelling island endemic pigeons. The following cladogram shows the dodo's closest relationships within the Columba Day, based on Shapiro and colleagues. Uh, the Victoria crown pigeon, the Nicobar pigeon, the Rodriguez solitaire, the dodo, and the tooth-bill pigeon. Yes. Okay, cool. Okay. A similar cladogram was published in the year 2007, inverting the placement of the Gora and uh, Didaunculus. And Gora is the crown pigeon, and the other one's the tooth-billed pigeon. Right. Um, and including the pheasant pigeon also, and also the thick-billed ground pigeon. Jeez, how many freaking pigeons are there? Right. And that is at the base of the clade. DNA used in these studies were obtained from the Oxford specimen, and since the material is degraded, and no usable DNA has been extracted from subfossil remains. These findings still need to be independently verified, <laughs> so they don't know. Right. Based on behavioral and morphological evidence, Jolin, <laughs> Jolan, Jolie, sure, Jolian, Jolian, sure, Jolian Parish, Jolan, I think it's Jolan, Jolan Parish proposed that the dodo and Rodriguez solitaire should be placed in the subfamily of Gorinae, along with the Gora pigeons and others. How about you just leave them alone, put them on their own? <laughs> right. Yes. Does it really matter? In agreement with the genetic evidence, that's what they said. We should we should do it that way. 2014, DNA of the only known specimen of the recently extinct spotted green pigeon was analyzed. And it was found to be a close re relative of the Nicobar pigeon, and thus also the Dodo and Rodriguez. Okay, so they're pigeons. The relatives of the pigeons, guys. Right. The 2002 study indicated that the ancestors of the dodo and the solitaire diverged around the paleogene-neogene boundary about 23.03 million years ago. False. Well, no. The Mascarene Islands, Mauritius, Reunion, Reunion, and Rodriguez, are of volcanic origin and are less than 10 million years old. Yes, they are less than 10 million years <laughs> old, for sure. Therefore, the ancestors of both birds probably remained capable of flight for a considerable time after the separation of their lineage. The Nicobar and spotted green pigeon were placed at the base of the lineage leading to the Rapinae, which indicates the flightless Raffines had ancestors that were able to fly, were semi-terrestrial, and inhabited islands. These motherfuckers don't know shit. Right. This in turn supports the hypothesis, there's that word, that the ancestors of those birds reached the ma Mascarene Islands by island hopping from South Asia. Man, y'all heard of uh, bar hopping. <laughs> These guys are island hopping. The lack of mammalian herbivores competing for resources on these islands allowed for the solitaire and the dodo to attain very large sizes and flightlessness. Yeah. So they evolved because they didn't need to fly because all their shit so was already there. Because yeah. they ate so much shit they couldn't fly. Right. Well, they didn't need to fly. Right. Despite its divergent skull morphology and adaptations for large size, many features of its skeleton remain similar to those of smaller flying pigeons. Another large flightless pigeon, the Vidi Levu giant pigeon, was described in 2001 from a subfossil material from Fiji. It was only slightly smaller than the dodo and the solitaire, and it is it is also thought to have been related to the crown pigeons. Okay. They all come from pigeons. All right. One of the original names for the dodo was the Dutch Walgvogel, first used in the Journal of Dutch Vice Admiral Wybrand van Warwijk, who visited Mauritius during the Second Dutch Expedition to Indonesia in 1598. Walge means tasteless, insipid, or sickly, and vulgo means bird. <laughs> tasteless bird. All right, sickly bird. Sickly bird. Yeah, they probably looked right. weird. The name was translated by Jacob Friedlib into German as Wallstock or 
Walch Vogel. The original Dutch report titled Warktij Beschreving was lost, but the English translation survived, which is. Dread. On their left hand was a little island, which they named Hemskirk Island, and the bay itself they called Warwick Bay. Here they tarried 12. Don't know what that means. Twelve. Oh, tarried 12 days, spelled days wrong, to refresh themselves. Dude, these, these guys are ignorant. Right. Themselves. Fine, in, in this Plays great quantity of fowls, twice as big as swans, which they call wallstocks or wallow birds, being very good meat. Oh. But finding an abundance of pigeons and popinays, which are parrots, they disdain any more to eat those great fowls, calling them wallow birds. That is to say, loathsome or fulsome birds. Do you imagine? Are there like wild parrots now? Yeah, no, nowadays freaking huge. Wild? Yeah, parrots all over the place. Hmm. Another account from that voyage, perhaps to the first mention of the dodo, states that the Portuguese referred to them as penguins. The meaning may not have been derived from penguin, actual penguin, but from pinion, a reference to the small wings. Well, the Portuguese referred to penguins as foda cows at the time. Right. The crew of the Dutch ship Gelderland referred to the bird as dronte, meaning swollen, a big old swollen bird. That was in 1602, a name that is still used in some languages. Okay. This crew also called them Griffint and Kermisgans in reference to Fowl Fatten for the Kermes Festival in Amsterdam, okay. which was held at the day after they anchored on Mauritius. All right. Well, the etymolo- et- etymology of the word dodo is unclear. Some ascribe it to the Dutch word dodor for sluggard, but is more probably related to dodars, which means either fat arse <laughs> or not arse, referring to the knot of the feathers on the oh, hind end. Right. First record of the word dodars is in Captain William or Willem Van West Zannon's journal in 1602. The English writer Sir Thomas Herbert was the first to use the word dodo in print in a 1634 travelogue, claiming it was referred to as such by the Portuguese who had visited in 1507. Okay. Another Englishman, Englishman Emmanuel Otham, had used the word in 1628 in a letter in which he also claimed it was origin from Portuguese. The name dodar was introduced into English at the same time as dodo, but was only used until the 18th century. As far as is known, the Portuguese never mentioned the bird. Well, ain't that weird. Nevertheless, some sources still state that the word dodo derives from the Portuguese word dodo, currently uh, doido, meaning fool or crazy. Mm. Or crazy boy. It's like crazy boy. That's why they call him your dodo. Yeah, you dodo bird. It has also been suggested that the dodo was an onomatopoeic approximation of bird's call a two-note pigeon-like sound resembling do do like right. but it was doo, doo. <laughs> right wow the <laughs> latin name calculatius which is hooded was first used by uh juan isbio nirenberg Uh-oh. in 1635 as cygnus cali calculatus in reference to the carolus clusius 1605 depiction of a dodo in his 18th century class work, Systema Nature, Carl Linnaeus used Cuculatus as the specific name, but combined it with the genius name Struthio, which is ostrich. Matherin Jacques Brisson coined the, 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 gen, the genus name Rathis, referring to the bustards in 1760, resulting in the current name of Rathis Cuculatus. In 1766, Linnaeus coined the new binomial didis ineptus, meaning inept dodo. This has become a synonym of the earlier name because of the nomenclatural priority. (laughs) I hate these articles. As no complete dodo specimens exist, its external, its external appearance, such as plumage and coloration, is hard to determine. Illustrations and written accounts of encounters with the dodo between its discovery and its extinction from 1598 to 1662 are the primary evidence for its external appearance. According to most representations, the dodo had grayish or brownish plumage with lighter primary feathers and a tuft of curly light feathers high on its rear end. The head was gray and naked. The beak, oh, so that's a vulture. Uh, the beak green, black, and yellow, and the legs were stout and yellowish with black claws. Study of the few remaining feathers on the Oxford specimen head show that they were Penacuous rather than plumacious, which means downy. So I'm guessing penacuous means up, and the most similar to those of other pigeons. So, okay. A penacuous feather has a stalk or a quill. Oh, okay. So they have quills. That's what they use for pens. 
Right. And then a plumaceous, plumaceous. Oh, oh, it's like a chick. Yeah, like a little chickity chick, 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 chick. chick. <laughs> the, the chick, chick, chick. <laughs> They're found <laughs> under the tough exterior feathers. Right. right. Some fossil remains and remnants of the birds that were brought to Europe in the 17th century show that dodos were very large birds, up to one meter, that is three foot, three inches tall. The bird was sexually dimorphic. Males were larger and had proportionately longer beaks. Weight estimates have varied from the study to study. 1993, Bradley Livesey proposed that males would have weighed about 21 kilograms or 46 pounds, and females about 37 pounds. Although, also 1993, Andrew Kitchener, attributed a high contemporary weight estimate and the roundness of dodos depicted in Europe to these birds having been overfed in captivity. Weights in the wild were estimated to be between the ranges of 23 to 39 pounds, and fattened birds would have weighed about 48 to 61 pounds. Sure. 2011 estimate by Angst and colleagues gave an average weight as low as 22 pounds. This also has been questioned, and there's still controversy over weight estimates. (laughs) Big turkey. Uh, 2016 study estimated the weight at 23 to 32 pounds based on CT scans of composite skeletons. It also been suggested that the weight depended on the season, clearly, and that individuals were fat during cool seasons, but less so during hot. Okay, so like any other animal. Right, geez, old Pete. The skull of the dodo differed much from those of other pigeons, especially in being more robust, the bill having a hook tip. That's where you can eat meat or dig down. And, right. right. And the upper bill was nearly twice as long as a cranium, which was short compared to those of the closest pigeon relatives. That's, that's, why, that's why I say it's more of a uh, more of a buzzard, more of a vulture. The openings of the bony nostrils were elongated along the length of the beak, and they contained no bony septum. The cranium, excluding the beak, was wider than it was long. Cool. Mm-hmm. And the frontal bone formed a dome shape with the highest point above the hind part of the eye sockets. The skull sloped backwards at the back, and the eye sockets occupied much of the hind part of the skull. Big eyes. All right. Well, the sclerotic rings inside the eye were formed by 11 ossicles, which were small bones similar to the mount and other pigeons. The mandible was slightly curved, and each half had a single fenestra, which is an opening, as in other pigeons. Dodo had about 19 presyncacral vertebrae, those of the neck and thorax, including three fused into a notarium, notarium, 16 sin sacral vertebrae, uh, those of the lumbar region and the sacrum, six free tail vertebrae, and a pygo style. <laughs> the neck had well-developed areas for muscle and ligament attachment, probably to support the heavy skull and beak. On each side, it had six ribs, four of which articulated with the sternum through sternal ribs. The sternum was large, but small in relation to the body, compared to those of much smaller pigeons that were able to fly. Oh, shit. Okay. The sternum was highly pneumatic, broad, and relatively thick in cross-section. The bones of the pectoral girdle, shoulder blades, and wing bones were reduced in size compared to those of a flight pigeon, obviously, and were more gracial compared to the, those of the Rodriguez solitaire. But none of the individual skeletal components had disappeared. Okay. The Carpa metacarpus, the Carp Carpa meta, metacarpus, the Carpa metacarpus of the dodo was more robust than that of the solitaire. Why can't you just say the damn thing that it is? Right. It's the frickin' the bone wing. found in the hands. Right, the hand bones. It's right before the end of the wings. Connected to the wing bone. <laughs> Jeez, guys. Jeez, the hand bone. The hand bone of the dodo was more robust than of the solitaire. The pelvis was wider than that of the solitaire and other relatives, yet was comparable to the proportions in some smaller uh, some smaller flighted pigeons. I mean, most birds are going to look a freaking like anyway. Right. Jeez. Most of the leg bones were more robust than those of the extant, extant pigeons in the solitaire. But... The length proportions were a little different. Oh, my gosh. Many of the skeletal features that distinguish, distinguish the dodo and the Rodriguez solitaire, its closest relative, from other pigeons have been attributed to their flightlessness. The pelvic elements were thicker than those of the flighted pigeons to support the higher weight, and the pectoral region and the small wings were pedomorphic, meaning that they were underdeveloped and retained juvenile features. The skull, trunk, and pelvic limbs were paramorphic, meaning that they have changed considerably with age. Okay, the dodo shared several other traits with Rodriguez solitaire, such as features of the skull, pelvis, sternum, as well as their large size. It differed in other aspects, though, such as being more robust and shorter than the solitaire, having a larger skull and beak, rounded skull roof, and smaller orbits. Dodo's neck and legs were proportionally shorter, 
and did not possess an equivalent to the knob presence on the solitaire's wrist. <laughs> uh, most contemporary descriptions of the dodo are found in ships' logs and journals of the Dutch East India Company vessels that docked in Mauritius when the Dutch Empire ruled the island. <clears throat> These records were used as guides for future voyages. Few contemporary accounts are reliable, as many seem to be based on earlier accounts, and none were written by scientists. Oh, because scientists are the know all. Right. One of the earliest accounts from Van Warwick's 1598 journal describes the bird as follows Blue parrots are very numerous there, as well as other birds, among which are a kind conspicuous for their size, larger than our swans, with huge heads only half covered with skin as if cloth with a hood. These birds lack wings, in the place of which three or four blackish feathers protrude. Uh, the tail cons- what the, fuck? the tail consists of a few soft incurved feathers, which are ash-colored. These we used to call wogvogel for the reason that the longer and oftener they were cooked, the less soft and more insipid eating they became. Really? Nevertheless, their belly and breasts were of a pleasant flavor and easily masticated. Cool. So they were good eating then, huh? Wow, Unless one, you cook them too long. Right. One of the most detailed descriptions is by Herbert in a relation of some years' travel into Africa. And uh, Greater Asia from 1634. Basically, my travels to Africa and Asia. <laughs> right. 1634. First here only and in Rodriguez is generated the dodo, which for shape and rareness, many antagonized the phoenix of Arabia. Oh. Doesn't fake, even look at Fake bird. Right. Her body is round and fat. Few weigh less than 50 pounds. It is reputed, reputed, it is reputed more for wonder than for food. Greasy stomachs may seek after them. But to de- uh, to the delicate, they are offensive and of no nourishment, just like a goose. The dude said the breasts were good. Just like a goose to its greasy ass. He said their be- the belly and breasts were a pleasant flavor. Right. The other guy did. Right, but yeah. Yeah, just like a geese. Like a goose. Well, they're saying, he's saying the greasy stomachs of right. hungry people, not of the bird. Right, but they are. Her name's me. Her vicious darts forth melancholy. As sensible of nature's injury in framing so great a body to be guided with complemental wings, so small and impotent. And there they serve only to prove her a bird. That's it. <laughs> the half of her head is naked, seeming cord with a fine veil. Her bill is crooked downwards, in midst to the thrill of the nostril, from which part to the end tis a light green, mixed with pale yellow tincture. Her eyes are small and look like diamonds, round and rowling. Her clothing... They had diamonds back then? Right. Her clothing, downy feathers. Her train, three small plumes, short and improportionable. Her legs suiting her body. Oh, her, what the hell? Is this guy talking about a bird? Right. <laughs> her pounce is sharp. Her appetite strong and greedy, like a vulture. Stones and iron are digested. Which description will better be conceived in her representation? Representation. Okay. The travel journal of the Dutch ship Gelderland, 1601 to 1603, rediscovered in the 1860s, contains the only known sketches of living or recently killed specimens drawn on Mauritius. They've been attributed to the professional artist Joris Justens Laurel, who also drew another now extinct Mauritian birds, and to a second less refined artist. Okay. Apart from these sketches, it is unknown how many of the 20 or so 17th century illustrations of the dodos were drawn from life or from stuffed specimens, which affects their reliability. Right, because somebody could have stuffed the shit out of them. Since dodos are otherwise only known from limited physical remains and descriptions, contemporary artworks are important to reconstruct their appearance in life. Not really, because nobody really gives a shit. <laughs> While there has been an effort since the mid-19th century to list all historical illustrations of dodos, previously unknown depictions continue to be discovered occasionally. The traditional image of the dodo is of a very fat and clumsy bird. But this view may be exaggerated. You don't know. Uh, the general opinion of scientists today is that, there's that word again, opinion is that today is that o- many old european depictions were based on overfed captive birds or crudely stuffed specimens which i'd say most likely true it has also been suggested that the images might show dodos with puff feathers as part of display of behavior yeah, like a uh, peacock the dutch painter roland savory was the most prolific and influential illustrator of the dodo having made at least 12 depictions often shown in the lower corners a famous painting of his from 1626 now called Edwards's Dodo, as it was once owned by the Orn- 
Ornithologist George Edwards has since become the standard image of a dodo. It is housed in a Natural History Museum in London, and the image shows a particularly fat bird and is the source for many other dodo illustrations, which, yeah, I mean, that's a dodo. Right. Supposedly. Supposedly. An Indian Mughal painting rediscovered in the Hermitage Museum of St. Petersburg, 1955, shows a dodo along with native Indian birds. It depicts a slimmer, brownish bird, and its discoverer, Alexander Ioano, and British paleontologist uh, Julian Hume, they regarded it as one of the most accurate depictions of the living dodo. The surrounding birds are clearly identifiable and depicted with appropriate coloring. It is believed to be from the 17th century. So what? You can have easily draw those birds and then right. what do you think the dodo looks like, you morons? Well, the other birds are correct, so <laughs> has to be. That's like me. That's like me <laughs> painting like the uh, uh, Empire State Building and a bunch of other uh, factual buildings and me like putting in right. a, fic- a fictional building and right. like this building must have been real because look at all the other buildings. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Shut up. You're now there. So stupid. Oh, my. It is believed to be from the 17th century and has been attributed to the Mughal painter Ustad Mansur. First of all, <clears throat> this is Indian. They're only in Madagascar, so why is he there? With, right. uh, why is it depicted with a bunch of Indian birds? Native Indian birds. Right. So they're... You gotta put two and two together there, guys. You would think. Idiots. The bird depicted probably lived in the menagerie of the Mughal Emperor. Okay, so he stole it. Janet Hager, located in the Surat, where the English traveler Peter Mundy also claimed to have seen two dodos sometime between 1628 and 1633. 2014, another Indian illustration of a dodo was reported, but it was found to be a derivative of an 1836 German illustration. All post-1638 depictions appear to be based on earlier images around the time reports mentioning dodos became rarer. Differences in the depictions led ornithologists such as Anthony Cornelius Oudmans and Musaji Hachasuka, Hachasuka to speculate about sexual dimorphism. Dimorphism, onto, <laughs> ontogenic traits, seasonal variation, and even the existence of different species. But these theories are not accepted today. Of course, they're not. She can't have different opinions. Okay, I mean, but it's also reasonable to think that if there's one type of dodo bird, there's probably more. Exactly. Because they existed. Right. Because details such as markings of the beak, the form of the tail feathers, and coloration vary from account to account. It is impossible to determine the exact morphology of these features. Maybe they're all seeing different breeds. Exactly. Whether they signal age or sex, or if they even reflect reality. Hume argued that the nostrils of the living dodo would have been slits, as seen in the... Gelderland, Cornelius Schaftevan, Savory's Cocter Art Gallery, and Mansoor Images. All those, he says, that the, the, the slit, the, the, <laughs> the nostrils were slits, not right. holes. Right. According to this claim... The, well, the one thing I think in the Gelderland ship log, it said that their nostrils were slit from like the length of the beak. Right. According to this claim, the gaping nostril often seen in paintings indicate that taxidermy specimens were used as models. Most depictions show that the wings were held in an extent position, unlike flighted pigeons, but similar to radites, such as the ostrich and kiwi. The kiwi bird, huh? Hmm. Little is known of the behavior of the dodo, as most contemporary descriptions are very brief. Based on weight estimates, it has been suggested the male could yes, we all been <clears throat> suggested the male could reach twenty one years old and the female seventeen. That's cool. Studies of the cantilever strength of its leg bones indicated that it could run quite fast. I bet. The legs were robust and strong to support the bulk of the bird, and it also made it agile and maneuverable in the dense pre-human landscape. Though the wings were small, well-developed muscle scars on the bones show that they were not completely vestigial and may have been used for display behavior and balance. Clearly. So they could right. puff them out. Uh, extant pigeons also use their wings for such purposes. Well, I'm sure all their birds do, too. Unlike the Rodriguez solitaire, there's no evidence that the dodo used its wings in intraspecific combat. Though some what's the evidence for the? I'm curious about what's the evidence for this Rodriguez solitaire guy. Right, they don't the, even know this guy's extinct. Right, though. So some dodo bones have been found with healed fractures. It had been weak pectoral muscles and more reduced wings in comparison. The dodo may instead have used its large hooked beak in territorial disputes, or its feet. Right. Since Mauritius receives more rainfall and less seasonal variation than Rodriguez, which would have affected the availability of resources on the island. The dodo would have less reason to evolve aggressive to territorial behavior. Right. The Rodriguez solitaire was therefore probably the more aggressive of the two. 2016, the first 3D endocast was made from the brain of the dodo. The brain-to-body size ratio was similar to that of a modern pigeon. 
indicating that dodos were probably equal in intelligence, which were very smart. Good for them. The preferred habitat of the dodo was unknown, but old descriptions suggest that it inhabited the woods on the drier coastal areas of South and West Mauritius. Well, the only place they could. This view was supported by the fact that the Mare All Sanja Swamp, where most dodo remains have been excavated, is close to the sea in southeastern Mauritius. These guys are idiots. Such a limited distribution across the island could well have contributed to its extinction. 1601 map from the Gelderland Journal shows a small island off the coast of Mauritius where dodos were caught. Julian Hume has suggested this island was Lyle Benetius in Tamarin Bay on the west coast of Mauritius. <laughs> okay. So fossil bones have also been found inside caves in the highland areas, indicating that it once occurred on the mountains. Yeah, work at the Mara Ox Song Swamp has shown that its habitat was dominated by the Tambaloka Q, Tambaloka Q, which is the dodo tree, and the Pandanus trees and endemic palms. The near coastal placement and wetness of the Mara Ox Songs led to a high diversity of plant species, whereas the surrounding areas were drier. Many endemic species of Mauritius became extinct after the arrival of humans, so the ecosystem of the island is badly damaged and hard to reconstruct. Before humans arrived, Mauritius was entirely covered in forests, but very little remains of them today because of, you got it, deforestation. <laughs> Their surviving endemic fauna is still seriously threatened. The dodo lived alongside other recently extinct Mauritian birds, such as flightless red rail, the broad-billed parrot, the mascarine gray parakeet, the Mauritius blue pigeon, the Mauritius scope scops owl, the mascarine coot, the Mauritian shell, shell duck, the Mauritian duck, the Mauritius night heroine, heron. Uh, extinct Mauritian reptiles include the saddleback Mauritius giant tortoise, the domed Mauritius giant tortoise, the Mauritian giant skink, and the round island burrowing bow, boa. Uh, the small Mauritian flying fox and the snail Tropidorpha car carinata lived on Mauritius and Reunion, but vanished from both islands. Some plants such as Caesaria tinifolia and the palm orchid have been uh, become extinct as well. <laughs> okay. 1631 Dutch letter, long thought lost, but rediscovered in 2017, is the only account of the dodo. They just rediscover this. Right. Is the only account of the dodo's diet and also mentions it use its peak for defense. The document uses wordplay to refer to the animals described, with dodos presumably being an allegory for wealthy mares. The mares are superb and proud, it says. They presented themselves with an unyielding, stern face, wide open mouth, very jaunty and audacious of gait. They did not want to budge before us. Their war weapon was the mouth, with which they could bite fiercely. Their food was raw fruit. They were not dressed very well, but were rich and fat. Therefore, we brought many of them on board to the contentment of us all. Okay. Just to look at them and play with them, you weirdos. Try to eat them. Right. Uh, in addition to fallen fruits, the dodo probably subsisted on nuts, seeds, bulbs, and roots. It's not a meat eater. Mm. It's also been suggested that the dodo might have eaten crabs and shellfish, yes. like their relatives, the crown pigeons. Its feeding habits must have been versatile, since captive specimens were probably given a wide range of food on the long sea journeys. That's true. Uh, eat what you can get, I guess, mm -hmm. huh? Audman suggested that the Mauritius, that as Mauritius has marked dry and wet seasons, the dodo probably fattened uh, on ripe fruits at the end of the wet season to survive the dry season when food was scarce. Contemporary reports describe the bird's greedy appetite, which is vulture-like. Right. The Mauritian ornithologist Franz Staub suggested in 1996 that they mainly fed on palm fruits, and he attempted to correlate the fat cycle of the dodo with the fruiting regime of the songs. Or the palms. Um... So whenever the palms fruited, that's when they got fat, and then they stored that shit until they fruited again the next season? I suppose. I guess. Skeletal elements of the upper jaw appear to have been rhinchokinetic. Rhinchokinetic. Movable in relation to each other. Well, movable, bo movable jaw, huh? Uh, which must have affected its feeding behavior. In extant birds such as frugivorous, which is fruit-eating pigeons, Kinetic pre-maxillae help with the consuming large food items. Whatever. The beak also <laughs> appears to have been able to withstand high force loads, which indicates a diet of hard food. Right. Crabs, maybe. Right. Examination of the brain endocast found that, though the brain was similar to that of other pigeons in most respects, the dodos had a comparatively large olfactory bulb. This gave the dodo a good sense of smell. 
which may have added in locating fruit and small prey. Good for them. Several contemporary sources state that the dodo uh, used gastroliths, which are gizzard stones, to aid digestion. The English writer Sir Haman La Estrange <laughs> witnessed a live bird in London and described it as follows. About, 18, or about 1638, as I walked London streets, I saw the picture of a strange-looking fowl hung out upon a cloth, and myself, with one or two more in company, went to go see it. It was kept in a chamber, and was a great fowl, somewhat bigger than the largest turkey cock, and so legged and footed, but stouter and thicker, and more of erect shape, colored before like the breast of a young cock pheasant, and on the back of a dun or derrick color. Fuck you, dude! Right. Just say the words. <laughs> Um, so yeah, they thought it was a big turkey with a weird beak. Right. The keeper of the bird called it a dodo. And in the end of chimney in the chamber, there lay a heap of large pebble stones, whereof he gave it many in our sight, some as big as nutmegs. And the, and the keeper told us that she eats them. Um, and though I remember not how far the keeper was questioned therein, yet I'm confident after Yet I'm confident that afterwards she cast them all again. What the fuck is this guy even saying? I don't know. He's saying that the bird was eating stones, literally. Right. Okay. It is not known how the young were fed, but related pigeons provide crop milk. Contemporary depictions show a large crop, which was probably used to add space for food storage and to produce crop milk. It has been suggested that the maximum size attained by the dodo and the solitaire was limited by the amount of crop milk they could produce for the young dare. Okay, Co- common sense, dude. Why? Who made this article? <laughs> oh my! Ridiculous. Wow, 1973 dodo tree was thought to be dying out in Mauritius, to which it's endemic. I mean, stop using endemic. Right. It's native. All right. There are supposedly only 13 specimens left. All estimated to be about 300 years Only old. Only 13 trees at all? Wow. Stanley Temple hypothesized Stanley Temple. that it deepened on the dodo for its propagation and that its seeds would germinate only after passing through the bird's digestive tract. He claimed that the dodo tree was now nearly co-extinct because of the disappearance of the dodo. Oh, so they're saying the dodos are the only ones that would eat it and then poop right. out the seeds? Right. Temple overlooked reports from 1940s that found that the dodo tree seeds germinated, albeit very rarely, without being abraded during the digestion. Need a little bit of help. Right. Others have contested that this hypothesis... (laughs) Others have contested his hypothesis and suggested that the decline of the tree was exaggerated or seeds were also distributed by other extinct animals, such as the uh, tortoises, fruit bats, or the broad-billed parrot. According to Wendy Strom and Anthony Scheck, Two experts in the ecology of the Mascarene Islands, the tree, while rare, has germinated since the demise of the dodo and numbers several hundred, not 13 as claimed by Temple, Hmm. hence discrediting his view as to the dodo and the tree's sole survival relationship. Right. Tell me. One of them had to be there before the other. Probably the tree. Right. The Brazilian ornithologist Carlos Yamashita. That's a hell of a two names there. <laughs> Suggested in 1997 that the, my mother's uh, Spanish. My dad's my daddy's Japan. Japanese, Japanese. <laughs> uh, he suggested in 1997 that the broad-billed parrot may have de- depended on the dodos and the cylindrapsis tortoises to eat palm fruits and to excrete their seeds, which became food for the parrots. Ew. The and. The Anodor... Just the macaw, man. Oh, okay. The macaws depend on a now-extinct South American megafauna in the same way, but but now rely on domesticated cattle for the soybeans. Oh, look at that. They're like, yes. This account by Francois Koch from 1651 is the only description of the egg and the call from the uh, dodo. He says, I have seen the Mauritius birds... Uh, bigger than a swan without feathers on the body, which is covered with a black down. The hinder part is round. <laughs> mm-hmm. The rump is adorned with curled feathers, as many in number as the bird is years old. In place of wings, they have feathers like these last black and curved without webs. They have no tongues. The beak is large. Oh, really? They have no tongues. The beach is large, curving a little downwards. The legs are long, scaly, with only three toes on each foot. It was a cry like a gosling. Ryan? <laughs> <laughs> What is a gosling? A gooseling? Oh, a gooseling. So. <laughs> <laughs> what is that, a duck? Right. <laughs> Either or, and is by no means 
Uh, so savory to eat as the flamingos and the ducks of which we have just spoken. Damn, people are out there eating flamingos. Right. They only lay one egg, which is white, the size of a half penny roll, by the side of which they place a white stone the size of a hen's egg. Hmm. They lay on grass, which they collect and make their nests in the forest. If one kills the young one, a gray stone is found in the gizzard. We call them Ose de Nazareth. The fat is excellent to give ease to the muscle and nerves. Well, his account is problematic, though. Of course it is. Since it also mentions that the bird he was describing had three toes and no tongue, unlike dodos. This led some to believe that he was describing a new species of dodo. The description was most prob- probably mingled with that of the Casare, Casawari. And his writings have other inconsistencies as well. A mention of the young ostrich taken on board a ship in 1617 is the only reference to a possible juvenile dodo. An egg claimed to be that of a dodo is stored in the East London Museum in South Africa. It, it was denoted, <laughs> <laughs> it was donated by the South African Museum official Marjorie Courtney Latimer, whose great aunt had, <laughs> had received it from a captain who claimed to have found it in a swamp on Mauritius. In the year 2010, curator of the museum proposed using genetic studies to determine its authenticity. It may instead be an abhorrent ostrich egg. Well, because of the possible single egg collection, the bird's large side has been proposed that the, proposed that the dodo was K-selected, meaning that it produced few altricial offspring, which required parental care until they matured. Right. Some evidence, including the large size and the fact that tropical and fruit birds have slower growth rates, indicates that the bird may have been uh, may have had a protracted development period. All right, so it can't have that many birds. All right. The fact that no juvenile dodos have been found in the mar Sanja's swamp may indicate that they produced little offspring, that they matured rapidly, that the breeding grounds were far away from the swamp, or that the risk of mirroring was seasonal. Hmm. Okay, dude. What else you got? So, how about... I propose somebody do re-edit this edit, uh, article and just say, Dodo Birds, we don't know. Right. <laughs> we don't know. Here's a picture. <laughs> <Right>. Maybe. <laughs> wow. 2017 study examined the histology of the thin section dodo bones, modern Mauritian birds, local ecology, and contemporary accounts. They did this to recover information about the life history of the dodo. The study suggested that dodos bred around August after having potentially fattened themselves corresponding with the fat and thin cycles of uh, many vertebrae of the Mauritius. The chicks grew rapidly, reaching robust, almost adult size, and sexual maturity before austral summer of the cyclone season. So within weeks. Right. Adult dodos, which had just bred, molted after austral summer, around March. The feathers of the wings and tail were replaced first, and the molting would have completed at the end of July, in time for the next breeding season. Oh, yeah, dude. Different stages of molting may also account for inconsistencies in the contemporary descriptions of dodo plumage. <laughs> uh, Mauritius has been uh, previously been visited by Arab vessels in the Middle Ages and Portuguese ships, ships between 1507 and 1513, but was settled by neither. No records of dodos by these are known, although the Portuguese name for Mauritius, which is Swan Island, may have been a reference to dodos. The, they don't even look like swans. The Dutch Empire acquired Mauritius in 1598, renaming it after Maurice of Nassau, and it was used for the provisioning of trade vessels of the Dutch East India Company henceforward. Earliest known accounts of the dodo were provided by Dutch travelers during the second Dutch exp- expedition to Indonesia, led by Admiral Jacob van Neck in 1598. Cool. They appear in reports published in 1601, which also contained the first published illustration of the Boyd. Since the first sailors to visit Mauritius had been at sea for a very long time, their interest in these large birds were mainly culinary. <laughs> They're hungry. Oh, yeah. 1602 journal by Willem van West Zanen of the ship Bruinsvis. They mentioned that 24 to 25 dodos were hunted for food, which were so large that two could scarcely be consumed at mealtime. With all the people on the ship. Well, I, I mean, you got to figure if they're saying 40 pound birds, right. two of those, that's a lot of damn meat. The remains being preserved, the remains were also preserved by salting. An illustration made from the 1648 published version of his journal showing the killing of dodos, a dugong, and possibly masquerine gray parakeets, was captioned with a Dutch poem. Here in Hugh Strickland's 1848 translation, it says, For food, the seamen hunt the flesh of feathered fowl. They tap the palms, and round rump dodos they destroy. The parrot's life they spare, that he may peep and howl. 
That's cool. <laughs> and thus, his fellows to imprisonment decoy. Some earlier travels found dodo meat unsavory and preferred to eat parrots and pigeons instead. Others described it as tough but good. Some hunted dodos only for their gizzards, and at this and this was considered the most delicious part of the void. Dodos were easy to catch, but hunters had to be careful not to be bitten by their powerful beaks. That's not a poem at all. <laughs> <laughs> Where's the rhyme, dude? No rhyme or reason. See, right. <laughs> <laughs> the appearance of the dodo in the red rail led Peter Mundy to speculate 230 years before Charles Darwin's theory of evolution. He says of these two sorts of foul aforementioned for aught we yet know, not any to be found out of this island. They spelled island without an S back then. Which uh, lieth about a hundred leagues from St. Lawrence. A question may be demanded demanded how they should be here. And, dude, I feel like I'm... Li- li- <laughs> I feel like I'm reading a freaking uh, sentence from a... Uh, um, a retard, sorry. Uh, <laughs> A question may be demanded how they should be here and not elsewhere, be in so far from other land and can, <laughs> <laughs> can neither fly or swim <laughs> wither by mixture of kinds producing strange and monstrous forms or the nature of the climate, ire and earth and altering the first shapes in long time or how. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. What? <laughs> what the freak? Oh, Char or uh, Peter Mundy. Somebody get an education for this guy. <laughs> wow. The Dota was found interesting enough that living specimens were sent to Europe and the East. The number of transported Dodos that reached the destinations alive is uncertain and is unknown how they relate to contemporary depictions and the few non-fossil remains in European museums. Based on a combination of contemporary accounts, paintings, and specimens, Julian Hume has inferred that at least 11 transported dodos reached their destinations alive and well. <sighs> Haman Lestrange, La Estrange's description of a dodo that he saw in London in 1638 is the only account that specifically mentions a live specimen in Europe. Now, uh, in 1626, Adrian van de Ven drew a dodo that he claimed to have seen in Amsterdam, but he did not mention if it was alive, and its depiction is reminiscent of Savory's Edwards' dodo. Two live specimens were seen by Peter Munday in Surat, India, between 1628 and 34, one of which may have been the individual painted by Mansur around 1625. In uh, 1628, Emmanuel Otham visited Mauritius and sent a letter to his brother in England. He says, Wasn't that in, oh, geez, why, why wasn't that in the Breakfast that? Club? It's like, oh, man, sir, no, really it's glows Monet, really. Uh, yeah. yes, Monaire. Monaire. <laughs> uh, right, whoa, and loving brother, we were ordered by ye said council to go to an island called Mauritius. Lion in 20D of South Latitude, where we arrived ye 28th of May, this island having many goats, hogs, and cows upon it. Nice. Cows. And very strange fowls called by ye Portingal's dodo which for the rareness of the same, the like being not in ye world, but here I have sent you one by Mr. Pierce, Purse, who did arrive with the ship William at this island ye 10th of June. Which uh, This next part's in the margin of the letter. He says, Of Mr. Purse you shall receive a jar of ginger for my sister, some beads for my cousins, your daughters, and a bird called a dodo if it lives. <laughs> <laughs> if it's alive. If it, if it liveth. Right. Whether the dodo survived the journey is unknown. The letter was destroyed by fire in the 19th century. The earliest known picture of a dodo specimen in Europe is from a uh, 1610 collection of paintings depicting animals in the royal menagerie of Emperor Rudolf II in Prague. This collection includes paintings of other Mauritian animals as well, including a red tail. The dodo, which may be a juvenile, seems to have been dried or embalmed. And I probably lived in the Emperor's Zoo for a while together with the other animals. Oh, that whole uh, that whole stuffed dodos were present in Europe indicates that they had been brought alive and died there. Mm. It is unlikely that taxidermists were on board the visiting ships, and spirits were not yet used to preserve biological specimens. Right. Most tropical specimens were preserved as dry heads and feet. Right. The dodo was reportedly sent as far as Nagasaki, Japan, in 1647, but it was long unknown whether it arrived. Right. Contemporary documents first published in 2014 proved the story and showed that it had arrived uh, alive. 
It was meant as a gift, and despite its rarity, was considered of equal value to a white deer and a bezoar stone. Oh, shit. So, nobody cared. All right. It is the last recorded live dodo in captivity, supposedly, in 1647. Mm. So, they say, like many animals that evolved in isolation from significant predators, the dodo was entirely fearless of humans. This fearlessness and inability to fly made the dodo easy prey. Although some scattered reports describe mass killings of dodos for ships' provisions, archaeological investigations have found scant evidence of human predation. Bones of at least two dodos were found in caves at Bay du Cap that sheltered fugitive slaves and convicts in the 17th century, which would not have been easily accessible to dodos because of the high, broken terrain. So they're well. They went up there and ate them. Good for them. Food. The human population on Mauritius uh, never exceeded fifty people in the 17th century, but they introduced other animals, including dogs, pigs, cats, rats, and crab-eating macaw. Why would, you, why would you introduce rats? Well, right. They they just came <laughs> on boats. Yeah. They had no choice on the boats. Uh, which um, crab-eating macaques, which plundered dodo nests and competed for the limited food resources. Yeah. What are those? Are they birds? Yeah. <laughs> No, they're oh, monkey. the monkeys. Macaques. Yeah, they eat the monk. They eat the the yeah. eggs of the boids. Fuck yeah, they do. Monkeys are assholes. Like, this is my island now. At the same time, humans destroyed the forest habitat of the dodos. The impact of the introduced animals on the dodo population, especially the pigs and macaques, is today considered more severe than that of hunting. I would say. Yeah, rats too. Perhaps not as much of a threat to the nests, eh, since dodos would have been used. Used to dealing with local land crabs. Right. Uh, crabs and rats. All right. About the same. A little uh, different. Yeah, about the same. Land crabs aren't doing anything that rats are doing. Yeah, they're eating everything they can. Yeah, but are those the big guys? Yeah. You ever seen those big guys yeah. in like uh, Hawaii or whatever? Yeah. They literally that. eat birds. Um, they've had like swans and shit, and they're just eating them. Right. They're big. <laughs> it's been suggested that the dodo may already have been rare or localized before their rival humans on Mauritius. Since it would have been unlikely to become extinct so rapidly if it occupied all the remote areas of the island. 2005 expedition found subfossil remains of the dodos and other animals killed by a flash flood. Such mass mortalities would have further jeopardized a species already in danger of becoming extinct. Couldn't the dodos just float on top of the water like a duck or something? Right. Yet the fact that the dodo survived hundreds of years of volcanic activity and climate changes shows the bird was resilient within its own ecosystem. Mm, okay, some controversy surrounds the date of its extinction. The last widely accepted record of a dodo sighting is the 1662 reported uh, report by shipwrecked mariner Volkert Everett of the Dutch ship Arnhem, which describes birds caught on a small islet off of Mauritius, now suggested to be Amber Island. Well, this one, can I, is this good English? This one says, these animals on our coming up to them stared at us and remained quiet where they stand, not knowing whether they had wings to fly away or legs to run off, right. and suffering us to approach them as close as we pleased. Right. Amongst these birds were those which in India they called Dodd Arson, being a very kind of, uh, big kind of big, very big goose. These birds are unable to fly, and instead of wings, they merely have a few small pins, yet they can run very swiftly. We drove them together in one place in such a manner that we could catch them all with our hands. And when we held one of them by its leg, and that upon this it made a great noise. The others all on a sudden came running as fast as they could to his assistance, oh, sure. and by which they were caught and made prisoners also. Oh, jeez. Well, at least they were loyal. Right. Like, oh, no, don't you know? <laughs> the dodos on, on this islet may not necessarily have been the last members of the species, though. The last claimed sighting of a dodo was reported in the hunting records of Isaac Johann, Johannes Lamitus in 1688. 2003 statistical analysts of those records by the biologists David Roberts and Andrew Solo gave a new estimated extinction date of 1693 with a 95% confidence interval of 1688 to 1715. <laughs> These authors also pointed out that because the light, the last sighting before 1662 was in 1638, the dodo was probably already quite rare by the 1660s, and thus a disputed report from 1674 by an escaped slave could not be dismissed out of hand. So literally, this guy know the shipwreck guys that he was literally killing the last of the species, huh? Right. <laughs> wow. No. The British ornithologist Alfred Newton suggested in 1868 that the name of the dodo was transferred to the Red Rail after the former had gone extinct. Oh. Check. Cheke also pointed out that some descriptions after 1662 uses the names dodo and dodairs, dodairs, when referring to the Red Rail, indicating that they had been transferred to it. He therefore pointed to the 1662 description as the last credible observation. 1668 account by English traveler John Marshall, 
who used the names Dodo and Red Hen interchangeably for the Red Rail, mentioned that the meat was hard, which echoes the description of the meat in the 18, uh, 1681 account. Okay. Even the 1662 account has been questioned by the writer <laughs> Errol Fuller. Of course it has. And as the reaction to distressed cries matches that described for the Red Rail. Until this explanation was proposed, a description of Dodos from 1681 was thought to be the last account. And that date still has proponents. Cheek stated in 2014 that then recently accessible Dutch manuscripts indicate that no dodos were seen by settlers in 1664 through 1674. 2020 Cheek and the British researcher Jolan Parrish suggested that all mentions of dodos after the mid-17th century instead refer to red rails and that the dodo had disappeared due to predation by feral pigs during a hiatus in sediment of Mauritius from 1658 to 1664. Dude, those pigs just pigs are got hungry and was like, I'm eating you. Yep. The dodo's extinction, therefore, was not realized at the time since new settlers had not seen real dodos, but as they expected to see flightless birds, they referred to the red rail by that name instead. Okay. Since red rails probably had larger clutches than dodos and their eggs could be incubated faster and their nests were perhaps concealed, they probably bred more efficiently and were less vulnerable to pigs. Hmm. Fantastic. And is that Probably, maybe, we don't could know. be. It is unlikely the issue will ever be resolved, unless late reports mentioning the name alongside a physical description are rediscovered. The IUCN Red List accepts Cheek's rationale for choosing the 1662 date, taking all subsequent reports to refer to Red Rails. In any case, the Dodo was probably extinct by 1700. I would say. <laughs> <laughs> About a century after its discovery in 1598. The Dutch left Mauritius in 1710. But by then, the dodo and most of the large terrestrial vertebrates had become extinct. Even though the rareness of dodos reported already in the 17th century, its extinction was not recognized until the 19th century. Damn. All right. Well, this is partly because, for religious reasons, extinction was not believed possible until later proved by Georges Cuvier, and partly because many scientists doubted that the dodo had ever existed. It seemed altogether too strange a creature, and many believed it a myth. The bird was first used as an example of human-induced extinction in Penny Magazine in 1833 and has since been referred to as an icon of extinction. I think dinosaurs would be the icon of extinction. But. The only extant remains of dodos taken to Europe in the 17th century are dried head and foot in the Oxford University Museum of Natural History. A foot once housed in the British Museum but now lost. A skull in the University of Copenhagen Zoological Museum and an upper jaw in the National Museum in Prague. The last two were discovered and identified as dodo remains in the mid-19th century. Several stuffed dodos are also mentioned in old museum inventories, but none are known to have survived. Apart from these remains, a dried foot, which belonged to the Dutch professor Peter Paul, <laughs> <laughs> was mentioned by Carolus Clusius in 1605. Its provenance is unknown and is now lost, but it may have been collected during the Van Neck voyage. Supposed stuffed dodos seen in museums around the world today have in fact been made from the feathers of other boys. Clearly. Many of the older ones by the British taxidermist Rollins Wards Company. The only known soft tissue remains, the Oxford head and foot, belong to the last known stuffed dodo, which was first mentioned as part of the Tradescent Collection in 1656 and was moved to the Ashmolean Museum in 1659. It has been suggested that this might be the remains of the bird that Haman La Estrain saw in London, the bird sent by Emmanuel Otham, or a donation by Thomas Herbert. Again, we don't know. Since the remains do not show signs of having been mounted, the specimen might instead have been preserved as a study skin. Mm, okay. 2018 has reported that scans of the Oxford dodo's head show that its skin and bone contained lead shot, mm. pellets which were used to hunt boids in the 17th century. This indicates that Oxford Dodo was shot either before being transported to Britain or sometime after. The circumstances of killing are unknown. And maybe the pellets... It, maybe, be, <clears throat> maybe it was sickly in the end. Right. And the pellets are to be examined to identify where the lead was mined from. Well, good for them. Oh, well, that was five years ago. So uh, many sources state that the Ashmolean Museum burned the stuffed Dodo around 1755 because of severe decay, saving only the head and leg. Statute 8 of the museum states that as any particular grows old and perishing, the keeper may remove it into one of the closets or other re repository and some other to be substituted. The deliberate destruction of the specimen is now believed to be a myth. It was removed from the exposition, exhibition to preserve what remained of it. This remaining soft tissue has since degraded further, 
The head was dissected by Strickland and Melville, separating the skin from the skull in two halves. Idiots. Hmm. The foot is in a skeletal state with only scraps of skin and tendons. Very few feathers remain on the head. It is probably a female, as the foot is 11% smaller and more gracile than the London foot, yet appears to be fully grown. The specimen was exhibited at the Oxford Museum from at least the 1860s until 1998, where after it was mainly kept in storage to prevent damage. Cast of the head can today be found in many museums worldwide. Fantastic. That's the, uh, that's the foot, huh? No, it's the upper jaw. Supposedly. Hmm. The dried London foot, first mentioned in 1665 and transferred to the British Museum in the 18th century, was displayed next to Savory's Eduardo's uh, Dodo painting until the 1840s. And it was, too, dissected by Strickland and Melville. These Strickland and Melville guys were just like, we want to dissect them all. Oh, maybe. It was not posed in a standing posture, which suggests that it was severed from a French specimen. He's <laughs> like a wee wee. A dodo bird from a French. Uh, <laughs> which, which suggests that it was severed from a fresh specimen, not a mounted one. Right. By 1896, it was mentioned as being without its integuments. And only the bones are believed to remain today. Though it is present, whereabouts unknown. How could you unknown? That? Oh, come on. The Copenhagen skull, I guess there's a Copenhagen skull now, is known to be uh, part of the collection of Bernardus Peladonis and Enkhuizen until 1651 and when it was moved to the museum in Gottorf Castle, Schleswig. <laughs> After the castle was occupied by Danish forces in 1702, the museum collection was assimilated into the Royal Danish Collection. The skull was rediscovered by J.T. Reinhardt in 1840, and based on its history, it may be the oldest known surviving remains of a dodo brought to Europe in the 17th century. Well, fantastic. It is a half an inch shorter than the Oxford skull and may have belonged to a female. It was mummified, but the skin has perished. So it wasn't modified. Though. Right. Front part of the skull in the National Museum of Prague was found in 1850 among the remains of the, the Bohemius Museum. Other elements supposedly belonging to the specimens have been listed in the literature, but it appears only the partial skull was ever present. It may, it may be what remains of one of the stuffed dodos known to have been at the menagerie of the Emperor of Rudolf II, possibly the specimen painted by Hofnagel or Savary there. Okay... Um, until 1860, the only known dodo remains were the four incomplete 17th century specimens. Philip Bernard Ares found the first subfossil bones in 1860, which were sent to Richard Owen at the British Museum, who did not publish the findings. Okay. 1863, Owen requested the Mauritian Bishop Vincent Ryan to spread the word that he it should be informed if any dodo bones were found. And in 1865, George Clark, the government schoolmaster at Maheborg, finally found an abundance of subfossil dodo bones in the swamp. In southern Mauritius, after a 30-year search inspired by Strickland and Melville's monograph. Okay, fantastic. 1866. Clark explained. You're telling me they can't go there now and there's none left? Probably not. Who knows? Fa 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 <laughs> fossils don't just disappear. Right. 1866. Clark explained his procedure to the Ibis, an ornithology journal. He had sent his coolies to wade through the center of the swamp, feeling for bones with their feet. Yeah. At first, they found few bones until they cut away herbage and covered the deepest part of the swamp, where they found many. Harry Pasley Higginson, a railway engineer from Yorkshire, reports discovering the mare Ox Song's bones at the same time as Clark, and there is some dispute over who found them first. No. Oh. Higginson sent boxes of those bones to Liverpool, Leeds, and York Museums. Good for him. The swamp yielded the remains of over 300 dodos, but very few skull and wing bones possibly because the upper bodies were washed away or scavenged while the lower body was trapped. That's true. Somebody came with, like, um, the monkey or something right. came and ripped the head off. You know, they like eating brains and shit. Yeah. Uh, the situation is similar to many finds of moa remains in New Zealand marshes. The first dodo remains from the Mare Auk Sanges have a medium to dark brown coloration. Clark's reports about the finds rekindled interest in the bird. Sir Richard Owen and Alfred Newton both wanted to be first to describe the postcranial anatomy of the dodo, and Owen bought a shipment of dodo bones originally meant for Newton, which led to a rivalry between them. Imagine having a rivalry right. between Owen dodo bones. Dodo birds. <laughs> Jeez. Owen described the bones in a memoir on the dodo in October 1836, but erroneously based his reconstruction on the Edwards dodo painting by Savory, making it too squat and obese. 1869, he received more bones and corrected its stance, making it more upright. 
Newton moved his focus to the reunion solitaire instead. He said, fine. <laughs> right. I'll deal with this one. The remaining bones not sold to Owen or Newton were auctioned off or donated to museums. 1889, Theodore Saussier was commissioned to explore the historical souvenirs of the Mauritius and find more dodo remains in the Morag songs. He was successful and also found remains of other extinct species. Look at you guys. So why are we not searching this swamp anymore? So yeah. They're not all found. Uh, 2005, after 100 years of neglect, a part of the Mare Ox Saunders Swamp was excavated by an international team of researchers, which was the International Dodo Research Project. To prevent malaria, the British had covered the swamp with hard core during, like, <laughs> <laughs> during the rule of the Mauritius, which had been, uh, which had to be removed. What is hard core? Like mud? Foundation, pretty much. Okay. Due to malaria? Yeah, that swamp probably was breeding no, those damn things. Right uh, many remains were found, including bones of at least 17 dodos in various stages of maturity, though no juveniles. What's up with that? Right. <laughs> Several bones, obviously, from the skeleton of one individual bird, which have been preserved in their natural position. Oh, wow. Fantastic. These findings were made public in December 2005 in the Naturalist Museum in Leyden. 63% of fossils found in the swamp belong to twaddles of the extinct uh, Cylindropus, and 7.1% belong to dodos, which had been de deposited within several centuries, 4,000 years ago. Cool. Subsequent excavations suggested that dodos and other animals became mirrored in the mere the mare ox songs while trying to reach water during a long period of severe drought between, I mean, about 4,200 years ago. Furthermore, Cyanobacteria thrived in the conditions created by the excrements of animals gathered around the swamp, which died of intoxication, dehydration, trampling, and mirroring. Though many small skeletal elements were found during the recent excavations of the swamp, few were found during the 19th century, probably owing to the employment of less refined methods when collecting, obviously. Uh, well, Louis Etienne Thereo, Thoreau, an amateur naturalist at Port Louis, also found many dodo remains around 1900 from several locations. They included the first articulated specimen, which is the first subfossil subfossil dodo skeleton found outside the uh, swamp, and the only remains of a juvenile specimen, a now lost uh, tarso metatarsus. Why is it lost? All right. These people are idiots, dude. It's a bone that is only found in the lower leg of birds. So, yeah. So, the only time you've ever had one of those bones and you lose it. All right. Idiots. <laughs> <laughs> the former specimen was found in 1904 in a cave near La Pouse Mountain. It's the only known complete skeleton of an indiv individual dodo. Thero donated the specimen to the Museum des Jardins, now the Natural History Museum at Mauritius Institute. Okay. Thero's heirs sold a second mounted comp composite skeleton, composed of at least two skeletons, with mainly reconstructed skull. They sold that to the Durban Museum of Natural Science. Boo! Right? In 1918. <laughs> <laughs> Together, these two skeletons represent the most completely known dodo remains, including bone elements previously unrecorded, such as kneecaps and wing yeah, bones. kneecaps. Though some contemporary writers noted the importance of Thoreau's specimens, they were not significantly studied. Scientifically studied. Or scientifically. And significantly they were... Significantly scientifically studied. Right. They were largely forgotten until 2011 <laughs> when sought out by a group of researchers. The mounted skeletons were laser scanned from which 3D models were reconstructed, which became the basis of a 2016 monograph about the estiology of the dodo bird. 2006, explorers discovered a complete skeleton of a dodo in a lava cave in Mauritius. This was only the second associated skeleton of an individual specimen ever found and the only one in recent times. Damn, really? Worldwide, 26 museums have significant holdings of dodo material, <laughs> all, almost all found in the swamp. Natural History Museum, American Museum of Natural History, Cambridge University uh, Museum of Zoology, and the Senckenberg Museum, and others <laughs> have almost complete skeletons assembled from the disassociated subfossil remains of several individuals. 2011, a wooden box containing dodo bones from the Edwardian era was rediscovered at the Grant Museum at the University College London during preparations for a move. They had been stored with the crocodile bones until then. <laughs> okay. Oh, no. Okay, now we got to go to a, whole new a white dodo. The supposed white dodo 
of uh, Reunion is now considered an erroneous conjecture based on the contemporary reports of the Reunion Ibis and 17th century paintings of white dodo-like birds by Peter Peter Withos and uh, Peter Holstein that surfaced in the 19th century. The confusion began when William Yasberstoon Bounticoco, <laughs> who visited Reunion around 1619, mentioned fat, flightless boids that he referred to as Dodderson in his journal, though without mentioning their coloration. When the journal was published in 1646, it was accompanied by an engraving of a dodo from Savory's Crocker Art Gallery sketch. A white, stocky, and flightless bird was first mentioned as part of the Reunion fauna by Chief Officer J. Tatoon in 1625. Sporadic mentions were subsequently made by C.R. Dubois and other contemporary writers. Who gives a fuck? <laughs> Baron Edmund de Salis Longchamps coined the name Raphus Solitarius for these birds in 1848 as he believed the accounts referred to the species of dodo. When 17th century paintings of white dodos were discovered by 19th century naturalists, it was assumed they depicted these birds. Audman suggested that the discrepancy between the paintings and the old descriptions was that the paintings showed females and that the species was therefore sexually dimorphic. Some authors also believe the birds described were of a species similar to the Rodriguez solitaire, as it was referred to by the same name, or even that they were white species of both dodo and solitaire on the island. <laughs> what the freak is going on here? Uh, the Peter Withhose painting was also discovered first. Nope, which was discovered first appears to be based on an earlier painting by Peter Holstein. <laughs> <laughs> so Peter's stealing from Peter's. Three versions of all right, three versions of which are known to have existed, according to Hume, Cheek, Valador de La Zoya. It appears that also depict that all these depictions of white dodos are based on. Roland Savory's painting landscape with Orpheus and the animals, or on copies of it. The painting has generally been dated to 1611, though a post of 1614 or even uh, 1626. That date has also been proposed. Oh my goodness. <laughs> oh my. And you wonder why we don't believe in climate change. Right. Or Wikipedia. <laughs> <laughs> or science. Right. <laughs> The Earth's 8 million, no, 13.6 billion years old, and now all of a sudden it's 24.6. Get the fuck out of here. The paintings show a whitish specimen and was apparently based on a stuffed specimen then in Prague. A wall vogel described as, as having a dirty off-white coloring was mentioned in an inventory of specimens in the Prague collection of the Holy Roman Emperor Rudolf II, to whom Savory was contracted at that very time, 1607 to 1611. Savory's later, uh, several later images all show grayish birds, possibly because he had uh, by then seen another specimen. <laughs> <laughs> so, wasn't the dodo at all? Czech and Hume believe the painted specimen was white owing to albinism. I mean, I'm sure there's got to be rare ones like that. Every animal species has one of those, right? Okay. Uh, Valador de la Zoya has instead suggested that the light plumage was a juvenile trait, a result of bleaching of old taxidermy specimens or simply artistic license. Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, in eight, 1987, best year ever, scientists described fossils of a recently extinct species of ibis from Reunion with a relatively short beak, a barb. Barbanibus latipes before a connection to the solitary reports of it made. <laughs> <laughs> Cheek suggested to one of the authors, Francois Matu, that the fossils may have been of the Reunion solitaire, and this suggestion was published in 1995. The ibis was reassigned to the genus Threskiornis, now combined with a specific epithet solitarius from the binominal, binomial R. solitarius. Birds of this genus are also white and black with slender beaks, fitting the old descriptions of the Reunion Solitaire. No fossil remains of dodo-like birds have ever been found on that island. So why talk about it? The dodo's significance as one of the best-known extinct animals and its singular appearance led to its use in literature and popular culture as a symbol of an outdated concept or object, as in the expression, dead as a dodo. Or dead as a doornail. Is that where it comes from? Maybe. Uh, which is... Come to mean unquestionably dead or obsolete. Clearly. Similarly, the phrase to go the way of the dodo means to become extinct or obsolete, to fall out of common usage or practice, or to become a thing of the past. Dodo is also a slang term for stupid, dull-witted person, as it was said to be stupid and easily caught. Um, This is a dodo of an article. Right. The dodo appears frequently in works of popular fiction, and even before its extinction, it was featured in European literature as a symbol of exotic lands and gluttony due to its apparent fatness. 
1865, the same year that the Civil War was over, George Clark started <laughs> to publish reports about excavated dodo fossils. The newly vindicated bird was featured as a character in Lewis Carroll's Alice Adventures in the Wonderland. Cool. It was also thought that he included the dodo because he identified with it. (laughs) (laughs) Fat and uh, (laughs) stupid. (laughs) Fat and stupid. (laughs) And had adopted the name as a nickname for himself because of his stammer, which made him accidentally introduce himself as Dodo Dodgkins, (laughs) which which is his legal surname. Oh, instead of George Clark, it's Do uh, George Dodge 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 Dodson Dodgkin Dodson Dodson. Um. Today's generation of kids are dodos, too. Right. Carol, and the girl who served as inspiration for Alice, Alice Liddell, I didn't know she was a real girl, Hmm. had enjoyed visiting the Oxford Museum to see the dodo remains there. The book's popularity made the dodo a well-known icon of extinction. Popular depictions of the dodo often became more exaggerated and cartoonish following its Alice in Wonderland fame. Why not? Which was in line with the inaccurate belief that it was clumsy, tragic, and destined for extinction. Well, it was clumsy, wasn't right. it? Right. The dodo is used as a mascot for many kinds of products, especially especially in Mauritius. I would think that would be the number one. It appears as a support around the coat of arms of Mauritius and on Mauritius coins. It's used as a watermark on all Mauritian rupee uh, banknotes. And is features as the background of the Mauritian immigration form. Oh, oh, the dodos. Cool. A smiling dodo is a symbol of... It's impossible for a dodo to smile. <laughs> <laughs> a smiling dodo. <laughs> right. Their beaks don't move. All right. Right. Oh, my God. Uh, I guess. La dodo le la. <laughs> you dumbass. Uh. <laughs> don't drink our stupid bourbon. Oh, no. Oh. A smiling dodo is a symbol of the Brasseries de Bourbon, a popular brewer on the Reunion. Reunion? Reunion? Reunion. Whose emblem displays the white species once thought to be have lived there. The dodo is used to promote the protection of endangered species by environmental organizations such as the Dura Wildlife Conservation Trust and the Dura Wildlife Park. Center for Biological Diversity gives an annual Rubber Dodo Award to those who have done the most to destroy wild places, species, and biological diversity. It's kind of like the Razzie Awards for movies. Right. 2011, the Nepheline spider, Nepheline's dodo, which inhabits the same woods as the dodo once did, was named after the bird to raise awareness of the urgent need for protection of the Mauritius biota. Two species of ant from Mauritius have been named after the dodo, the Pseudolaceous dodo in 1946 and the Fado dodo in 2013. A species of isopod from a coral reef off a reunion was named Hansenium dodo in 1991. The name dodo has been used by scientists naming genetic elements, honoring the dodo's flightless nature. A fruit fly, a fruit fly gene within a region of chromosome required for flying ability was named dodo. In addition, a defective dodo gene, right? A defective transposable element family from the Phytophthora infestans was named dodo pie. <laughs> Want some of this dodo pie? <laughs> as it contained mutations that eliminated the eliminated the element's ability to jump to new locations in a chromosome. 2009, a previously unpublished 17th century Dutch illustration of a dodo went for sale at Christie's and was expected to sell for six thousand pounds. Okay. It is unknown whether the illustration was based off a specimen or on a previous image, and the artist is unde- unidentified. It sold for 44,000 pounds. Stupid. A uh, pair suggested it depicts a stuffed specimen as the looks dried. The poet Hilaire Balak included the following poem about the dodo. It better be a poem <laughs> in his Bad Child's Book of Beasts from 1896. He says, The dodo used to walk around take and take the sun and air. The sun yet warms its native ground. The dodo is not there. The voice which used to squawk and squeak is now forever dumb. Yet may you see his bones and beak all in the museum. (laughs) (laughs) All right. Eminem in that shit at the end, huh? (laughs) Right. And that was the dodo article of the dodo bird. That was the most dodoist article I've ever heard in my life. That was the dodoist thing I've ever seen. Witness, dude. Uh, written could, by by a couple of dodos. Or, uh, <laughs> read by, yeah. Uh, written. <laughs> written. <laughs> Good riddance. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Yes. Oh, no. I'm sorry, guys. Sometimes we're going to have articles like this. Not. Right. Uh, nah. <laughs> 70% of that page did not even need to be written. No, it did not. Or not. written. Right. <laughs> or written. <laughs> or written. <laughs> Anything. <laughs> sorry. That's just stupid, dude. 
Oh, man. I got to get off of this episode. Yeah. What are we going to next? Oh, jeez. I don't even know. As you know how we do it. The Wheel of Random. The Wheel of Accordingly. According to the Wheel. That's what we should call it. Damn. According to the Wheelopedia. <gasps> we could still change it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, click on the categories. What's our category going to be? Don't you do it. <sighs> Thank you. I don't want to hear about legendary. Uh, I do there. not at this time. Last for All right. <laughs> forever. I don't even know. Uh, events. Events is the uh, category. So what do we got on this category? Events. Well, World War II, one, September 11th. Oh, no. We're going to some uh, uh, big stuff here. That's going to be something huge. This is a two-parter all day. I don't care which one we're, we're clicking on. Um, here we go. <laughs> and we're going to be reading about the Industrial Revolution. Oh, geez, are we? <laughs> yes, we are. The Industrial Revolution is what we will be uh, reading about next. Remove that from the wheel. According to Wikipedia, the Industrial Revolution... Also known as the First Industrial Revolution, was a period of global transition of human economy towards more efficient and stable manufacturing processes that seeded the agricultural revolution, starting from Great Britain, continental Europe, and the United States, that occurred during the period from 1760 to about 1820 to 40. And we all know what happens there, and what do we got? I'm not even. Holy schmoly, dude. Causes, criticisms, uh, everything. Um, yeah, so, I mean, what are you going to do there? That was a dodo of an article about uh, the dodo, but next week, hopefully, we should learn some things. At least be interesting, I guess. Um, we're not going to have stupid people tapping on the um, table while people are trying to record a podcast. Dodo ass. <laughs> uh, yeah, dodo, the dodo revolution. <laughs> the industrial revolution. Next episode. Check out our other podcasts on the Bang Dang Network on YouTube, as well as Outlaws and Gunslingers. We'll be back next week for the Industrial Revolution, where the mother's beginners with. Bang Dang.